Okay. Uh, welcome to day four of the virtual summer school. Um, I will, uh, I don't really have any, oops, any announcements of note today. So we'll just get right into things. Um, well, we can um, move into some demonstrations of the portal. You've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of tutorials about uh, the notebook aspect. Um, today, you're going to learn more about the portal and um, how to explore data with the portal. And then after break, you'll we'll get into some uh, difference imaging analysis um, from Ryan. And then as usual, we will go to uh, breakouts where we can work together on projects. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Greg for a portal demo. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. This is this is great. Let me just uh, get started here with my uh, my screen sharing um, to be able to get you started with the uh, um, the portal aspect of the Ruben Science Platform. All right. Um, so what I should say first is that Ruben Science Platform has those two different aspects. There is the portal aspect, and there is a notebook aspect. Portal is something that is user interface driven. It's very uh, intuitive it's probably easier to get started with than the notebook aspect it turns out you cannot do some of the analysis within the uh, portal and that has to do with the fact that portal doesn't really allow you to execute some kind of a easily execute some kind of a, a python scripts or anything like this so uh, normally we would expect for the users to get themselves started and get going uh, on the portal and then maybe once they get a bit more comfortable to get things uh uh, done on in, within the uh, the notebook aspect, but it is possible to do some of the exactly the same uh, operations between the portal and the notebook, and that has to do with the fact that both of them allow for you to populate and edit and eventually execute uh, a command for using the um, astronomical data query language. So uh, this is just a short introduction. By the way, I was supposed to introduce myself first. I'm Greg Madejski. I'm part of the community science team and I'm at Slack. And most of my work is actually with variable sources. It has to do with primarily active galactic nuclei, but I also um, dabble with high energy astrophysics uh, aspect of, uh, of clusters of galaxies. And, and for the Rubin Observatory, I'll be interested in gravitational lensing and in fact time delay cosmography to determine Hubble constant using many of the multiple image uh, lenses uh, that are lensed multiple image quasars that are lensed by a by a host galaxy anyway so not host galaxy intervening galaxy anyway so let me get going to uh, on on the uh, on this particular tutorial and uh, let me just give you a bit of a of a rundown so in this tutorial we will explore the data for type 1 supernova using the IBAT photometry first, and then we'll go a little bit further into the different colors. For each one of the IBAT observation epoch, we're going to determine the atmospheric scatter and uh, um, uh, and uh, um, and also the, the, the sync of, the, of a given observation. Uh, and the science goal here will be that user knows that a supernova exploded in one very specific part of the sky, and that is in the coordinates that you see on the left-hand side. You can enter those by hand. I'm assuming that all of you already have uh, started up the uh, uh, portal aspect of the Rubin Science Platform, and if not, do raise your hand. We can actually, we will have a little bit of time, so we can we can actually get you maybe um, set up with this. Sounds like everybody's doing fine, so that's good, no problem. Okay, so now what is this DIA object stuff? It turns out that you can, Ruben will provide you something that's called different image analysis. There will be some kind of template, some kind of a set of observations of every region of the sky that now will be uh, used to subtract the current observation from it, or maybe the other way around. The current observation will have the template subtracted from it. And that the that, that, that two images, basically the difference between the two images is that this, this difference image analysis uh, part that I'm talking about, okay? So um, let me just maybe first of all get rid of yeah that's better that's, you probably can see more of a screen. So in this particular case, um, the uh, supernova is uh, uh, at location that I put here into coordinates or object name on a on a, in the left hand side, and it's at the location of sixty seven 
0.4579 right ascension and minus 44.0802 declination. And um, I'm going to only search within the radius of two arc seconds such that I only get that one particular uh, object in the uh, um, in, in, in our data. On the right hand side, the reason why I'm doing all this is because what I want to find out is what is the object ID for this particular object. And I would like to put that in to be able to search in this uh, DA object catalog. So the important part is, as if you're following the tutorial itself, is that you should have this uh, DP02-DC2-catalogs.dia uh, object. And that's the important part here. OK, so I'm going to e execute this. And all I want to get from this is essentially the, uh, um, the ID here. Uh, and I again will illustrate in the continuation of this uh, this demonstration of what this um, you know what are what are the observing conditions for this particular thing. Uh, so let me get started on this. And here we are going to get uh, um, just the the important part here is that you will get this number uh, in the second column of the table on the left hand side, which says DIA object ID. It's a long number. It's just simply one of the IDs and that all, all we needed this number for is to be able to enter into the next query. So the next step will be now I'm going to go back to the RSP tab search. OK, I'm going to click on that. OK, and. Uh, now I'm going to go into this box on an upper right hand side saying edit ADQL. Again, when I click that, that will bring me to a different screen. And here I'm going to enter the uh, uh, the set of ADL, uh, ADQL queries. Uh, and I'll let me just walk through those uh, relatively slowly. So I'm going to select the uh, source array and source declination from this DIA uh, object ID um, catalog from DA source. Uh, and then I'm going to join another catalog called CCD visit to be able to get the information about the specific uh, uh, conditions of the observation. So uh, that will give me, that will return um, the uh, flux, that will return the um, sync, and that will, turn, will also return the, uh, um, what I should say maybe, uh, it will return the uh, um, the the midpoint uh, time of observation. This is DIA source dot midpoint dot tie, and of course the filter name. But that I will come back with uh, that. We're going to change this a bit a bit later. So now one thing that uh, you need to see here is that we are going to convert the flux, this DIA source dot ps flux, to a magnitude, and this is this command SQL. Uh, underscore nanojansky to AB magnitude. Again, this is AB magnitude, apparent magnitude of the source that is being converted, uh, that, that, that is being uh, um, received or whatever returned from via this function from, uh, from the flux measurement. So there's one small warning that I would like to, uh, to, to give you here. It has to do with the fact that different image fluxes are converted to magnitudes in this tab query, but it's generally safe to do so because the supernova fluxes should never be negative in a difference image. Again, if the flux is negative, the uh, Nanojansky to uh, AB magnitude command will fail. Okay, so um, the in this particular case, we are going to have a, a, a basically a, a, maybe I should just go back one step. The, the as I mentioned earlier, the DIA template is created from a very long observation of the same field from eventually will be probably on the order of years or so. So when you subtract the two fields, again, as I mentioned, the negative, the flags could potentially be negative because there might have been a, uh, a some kind of a pre-flare of a star that eventually became supernova or something like this. So you could have a, potentially those negative flaxes and that will uh, that will make the uh, um, the function this, uh, uh, this, this uh, Nano density to magnitude up to magnitude C2L. Well. Uh, uh, I think some, yeah, oh, thank you. Somebody had a, their microphone on. All right. So okay. now when we determine the object. Um, I think there's a question from Bob. And also okay. there's a question on chat that uh, is requesting if you can put that ADQL query in the chat. Okay. I, um, Tina, would you be able to do this as you did it last time? Because once I have, I'm sharing Zoom, it's uh, it's a little hard. Right. Yeah. I am not able to. I'm so sorry today. 
Can okay. somebody else do it? <laughs> I, you know what? I just realized I can't do it. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it turns out that that's all I wanted. Okay, great. great. So I think, let me just see if, yeah, I think that that's now. Do you see it, Bob? Or, or what was Armand? I get it. Great. Yeah, that's great. good. That's good. Okay, excellent. So let me just get rid of this, uh, all this stuff on my screen. Great. Okay, now you can probably see uh, more clearly. All right. So you uh, you hopefully at this point uh, already know what is the uh, what is going to come with this particular ADQL. And again, this query, as I mentioned earlier, uses the CCD visit ID uh, to join the CCD visit table to obtain the mean sync measurement of the visit. Again, this is the whole idea behind joining to um, two different tables. Again, um, there is a bit more. If you go to the uh, uh, to the documentation for the DP zero point two, there is a very nice. Uh, set of instructions about what uh, different uh, ADQL queries might be uh, that Melissa kindly provided for all of us. All right. So now I'm going to execute this particular function, okay, by clicking search. And again, uh, in order to be able to, you know, if you have a search that might potentially return huge, huge number of rows, you definitely would like to limit that that, that number of rows. So this is only the illustration of this particular aspect of the uh, uh, of the portal aspect of the Rubin Science platform. There's this row limit on the bottom. In this particular case, it's not going to be particularly relevant because we're going to get relatively few uh, observations of the supernova because it only will be uh, pointings uh, that uh, are significantly significant detections in, <clears throat> in this table. So let me click search. Okay. <clears throat> And what this now returns every time you you hit search uh, when you have a table with array that basically uh, the plot on the right hand side by default will have basically a, a first two columns plotted against each other. So in this particular case, you don't necessarily want to have array versus deck plotted on the uh, on a screen, but you really would like to see the flags of the supernova itself. So to do this again, this is a sort of a step by step showing this amazing the terrific functionality of the uh, of the portal aspect when you hit the little two gears which says chart options and tools you will get a, a sub panel that will talk about that will request for the for you to plot the plot parameters so for the x i'm going to type in midpoint and i will all i need to do is to put letter m that's the only column in the table that i requested that has midpoint time, okay? And then in order to make it a bit more elegant, I'm gonna subtract 60,000 from this 60, 000, because that's basically the current observations are around the time of 60,000, okay? Uh, I'm going to, for the Y, which is what I want to plot here, would be PS. Uh, and then you can see that uh, uh, already the only column that has that PS in the beginning popped out immediately. So it's very convenient. You can just click on that and, and then go send. Now for trace options, uh, I'm going to basically leave the, the default. I can maybe instead of having RGBA, I, for instance, prefer to have a red color. So I can actually type red. I, I don't remember it cares for the case. And then um, for the chart options, which is something that has to do with basically putting a bit more elegant description of the chart i'm going to say this is supernova light curve and on x label i'm going to write m j d minus sixty thousand. okay and y label i'm going to say apparent magnitude and this is in i band and very important part is that I need to put reverse here because magnitudes are such that larger number, larger magnitudes, the fainter object. So obviously I don't, I want to make sure that this is reversed. And now I'm going to click apply. And you can see that supernova light curve looks very nice, very elegant, exactly what I expected. And what I should say is now you can hover over individual points and you can click on that point and notice that on the left hand side, there is a road that corresponds to that point. So you can actually immediately see what is the array, declination, object ID, and so on and so forth. Object ID will be the same because we requested just this one particular 
object ID to be one, two, five, two, two, blah, 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 whatever. Okay. And um, there will be some more uh, entries in that particular table. You can slide the little, uh, the, the, the sliding bar on the bottom. Notice that you also are receiving here the arc, the sync and arc seconds uh, for that particular pointing for the particular observation. So we actually will plot that as well in just one second. To plot the sync versus time, what you need to do is you need to add new chart. And the way you do this is again, you click on the uh, on this uh, on this double gear thing, and now you have to click add new chart. That will provide you with another yet plot on the right hand side in this uh, in this particular view. What we want to do here is we want to again have a scatter plot, which is the default in the adding after you add new chart. And for x, you want you also would like to have this midpoint tie minus sixty thousand. And for y, this time you want to have seeing. And again, this after typing letter S, that immediately will come up. Okay. And uh, with trace options, I'm not going to make any difference. It, it can stay the same circle. Maybe I can plot this as blue. Why not? And for chart options, again, I can put a title as seeing for X label. I would have again the same MJD minus 60,000. And for Y label, I can have something like uh, um, CCD this. Okay, so now. You can see that I have a second plot. I can, if I really wanted to, I could re restrict the seeing to, to 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 larger or to smaller uh, X ranges and stuff like this. So let me click OK on this, and notice that now on the right hand side you have a second chart that appeared and it uh, shows seeing. Now something that I need to point out is that those charts, those two charts on the right hand side and the table on the left hand side are linked. So for instance, if I plot, if I click on this point here, notice that the same point will appear as orange on both supernova light curve graph and on seeing graph, and also appears as an orange line in the table on the left-hand side. So that's pretty cool. So uh, you can actually play around with the, uh, um, uh, with the different uh, parameters of this. And you can, for instance, um, you know, just, just expand the, 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 the different charts. You can close uh, one of the charts simply by, if you want to, for instance, cut and paste, you can close this one and, and, uh, and just leave, leave another one. But I'm, I'm going to keep the, both charts on the screen for the time being. All right, now the next step that I would like to do is I would like to plot the, uh, the astrometric, sc astrometric scatter of the plot. There would be, I would like to add another yet chart here. Okay, so let me just, go into the double gear and I will add new chart and that would be my astrometric scatter plot. Okay. So I notice they plotted seeing, I plotted the flux or actually the magnitude to be exact. And the third one will be the uh, atmospheric scatter. But in order to do the atmospheric scatter correctly, I have to go back to slightly different plot and I will just basically, uh, let me just go to the uh, to my to my tutorial uh, to rendered version of the tutorial, and I will simply pick up the uh, uh, the information from this because of the fact that there is a slightly complex formula to be able to put the um, the uh, uh, the atmospheric scatter. So this is going to be I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to return to my uh, um, to my to my others so I hope I can find it easily yes uh, ch -ch -ch. Uh, ch -ch -ch. I probably just way too many windows on my screen but that's okay 
Oh, I better, I better find it. Just bear with me here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to, for X, I'm going to plot this number. Y is a little bit simpler because this is just basically Yeah, declination plus, and of course, times 3600, because I want to have this in arc seconds. Okay, so this is, I, I need the, the formula in the x direction, of course, was a little bit complicated, simply because of the fact that it also depends, the, the scatter depends on, on declination itself. So now I'm going to click OK. And for the time being, I'm going to, uh, for trace options, maybe I'll just, just to make this color to be purple. Excellent. Okay. And uh, in the chart options, I can add a chart title, basically, as astrometric precision. Okay. And again, uh, in X label, I can type. All right, offset, and here there will be. Okay, and uh, I'm going to now click OK on this guy. Excellent. And now you can see that we have this third plot, which gives us astrometric precision. And this is in arc seconds. It's very nice. Uh, and you can see that astrometric precision is on the order of a few tenths of an arc second. So seeing is on the order of maybe between three quarters and one arc second but the uh, astrometric precision is significantly better simply because of the fact that it's possible to centroid the position of the source to much better accuracy than, than seeing itself. All right, so you can see that there's three bands together and your plots might appear slightly differently than, than the one that we have here. And in this particular light curve, you can see that the best seeing epoch of this uh, observation of the supernova had apparent magnitude around 22 magnitudes and that uh, it's basically a pretty good choice for uh, scientific use cases that is useful for the uh, for this particular production. Um, no, in the plot, uh, you can see the atmospheric scatter that bright best sink epoch. Uh, the measured sky coordinates of the DA source are very close to the reported to the DA object. Does not necessarily mean that the coordinates for the best sink epoch are mo most are more accurate because of the coordinates of these objects are derived from the individual DIA sources, okay? So the point of this plot is more than the overall scatter is less than 0.3 arc seconds. Again, as I mentioned before, and it means that the co-registration is really pretty good. I think I have a, some kind of chat question. Um, Ryan, I know you've been able to read the chat question. So can you can you read it for me? Oh, uh, well, all I did is I just pasted the, the formula for your x-axis and y-axis in there. Okay, great. Thank you. That's very helpful. So people can actually follow this uh, on their own. All right. So we have those three charts. So I'm going to actually play a little bit. I'm going to return to the uh, RSP tab search, and I'm going to actually now remove the constraint that filter name is required to be just I, and you will see that I can plot exactly the same th set of plots in regardless of the filter uh, and, and then, so let me just do that, and you will see what, exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to go to edit ABQL, and I'm removing this very last line, which is basically ending the request for this very specific um, filter. And now I'm going to, again, perform the same kind of search. And I'm a bit surprised that things are going so slowly, but presumably this is all okay. I wonder if it has to do with the fact that there are many people who are actually participating and, and executing this on the same uh, on the same platform. Hmm.
yeah, this is somewhat unusual. You probably remember how quickly the uh, the the search was returned. So. Uh, Yeah, I'm probably going to cancel it at this point and return to the previous one. Um, and uh, again, so uh, let me just maybe go back to my tab search and edit ABQL. And again, I will try to re-execute it. Hopefully it will be faster now. Yeah, so Greg, uh, Yumi suggests that closing the previous queries might help. Okay. I'm a little surprised about that, but maybe you're right. There's plenty of those queries that I had here. Yeah, you could try that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I personally don't think it should make all that much difference, but maybe. Yeah, anyway, so uh, let me just go back. And I wonder if in my one of my previous queries, maybe I did not have a filter selected. No, but uh, I don't really want to uh, waste your time waiting for this particular query. But all I, all I would uh, illustrate here is the fact that now I, uh, at this point, it, you can actually do it yourself. At this point, I uh, will not have this column uh, uh, I will have the filter name, but I will not have this column selected only with filter I. So what you can do is if you manage to get your query executed faster than in my case, yesterday it worked just fine, today it doesn't want to do it. You can, in this particular column, you can write something else. There is something new in chat. And how did you find the ARIA and deck of the supernova? Very good question. Uh, the this is basically illustrating the fact that I somehow know that there was a supernova there. I found it from basically uh, it was I, I pulled I pulled this out of out of some background information that I had about this. Is the cadence correct for the filters? It turns out that uh, the cadence for specific observations will be very dependent whether we are going after the regular wild wide field of view observations and. Uh, uh, whether or, or potentially going for the deep drilling fields. I believe that deep drilling fields of the Rubin observations, which are relatively, I think they're five smaller uh, field of view areas, will be frequently visited much more frequently. And those are the ones that, 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 that there will be a, a more studies of a supernova. So I don't know if, uh, if, this, if this helps. Let me see if this guy finished. No, something's not quite. Ah, very good. Okay, finally it finished. Excellent. So now I'm going to go into my uh, uh, my X and Y. Uh, uh, I, this time I'm not going to bother with putting all the proper labels and stuff like this, but uh, uh, I'm just going to plot uh, the magnitude. And again, oh, I really should have done it in there. Sorry. Okay, I need to go, of course, into the reverse magnitude, applying and closing gives me this plot. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that it actually finished because this is sort of a nice illustration. What I can do is if I didn't specify the filter in my ADQL query, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually specify it now in the table itself. And this is another sort of illustration of, of the fact that you can actually do something cute here. I, I can, for instance, type equal I and hit the carriage return. And notice that now all of a sudden, I have exactly the same plot as I had before. I only restricted the observation for the filter to be only the I band filter, but I can do this, of course, with the G band filter. And notice that for the G band filter, we have uh, uh, only two or three observations here, okay? And again, my, my x-axis looks a little ugly because I didn't subtract the 60,000 from it, but that doesn't matter. This is just for the purpose of illustrating the fact that if I now remove the constraints here, notice that all the filters come back here, okay? So uh, at this point, maybe I'm almost out of time. And before I get kicked off the podium here, I should ask uh, if there are any questions. And it looks like there's one uh, that came from a, uh, from Roy Williams. And, uh, and, and it's just basically a, uh, the, the the purpose of this 
tutorial uh, was to show some of the functionality of the portal rather than give you sort of some kind of very specific scientific case. So I hope that uh, that uh, that this is clear to everybody. So let me stop here and uh, and wait for questions. All right. Uh, are there any hands that are up? I needless to say, I cannot see it on my on my side, or maybe I can actually do this. And uh, Greg, Greg uh, Robert Hines had a had a question uh, whether whether you can overlay filters on the same plot in different colors. Ah, very good question. Yes, it turns out that this is sort of a bit beyond the scope of this particular tutorial. There is a trick you can actually perform. And the way that tr that trick is very nicely described in portal tutorial, I believe it's number five. And portal tutorial number five basically does the perf performs the following thing. And maybe if I if uh, should I take the maybe a couple more minutes just to 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 put this to to describe this. But you can add sure. you can add one more column, okay? And you would you in this particular column. And now I will have to go back and remember exactly how uh how this happens let, let me just do this since uh since we were not running so short on time and it would be portal five so um notice that uh, uh right now i have multiple letters in this filter name here i r and so on and so forth so what i can do now is i can add in this particular column something that will be called uh Bands ASCII. This is just a name that I'm giving this, but the expression here, that's the trick. I'm going to actually ask for the ASCII value of the letter that is in the column called filter name. So the way I'm going to do this, and this will be ASCII, and this is a syntax is essentially, is very important. It has to be open parenthesis, double quote, close parenthesis. And another important part is that here you have to put long to be able to have a, just an integer. Okay. Now, if I, if I add this column, uh, hold on. It's uh, so it's, it's uh, in this particular case, I think I will have to add. It's not its filter name. Okay. Okay, and again, it has to be entered this long, and I can add this column. Okay, and notice what happened here. You have magically this thing called bands ASCII, one additional color, column, okay? So now what I can do is I can add, yeah, I can change my plot parameters here, and basically what I will do in the plot parameters, I will, for the trace options, I will just add some more information here. And color map, I'll call this color map called this using this new new uh, new column. And for the color uh, scale, I will use some kind of y, orange, and red, and so on and so forth. Okay. Aha! Uh -huh. Take a look at what happened here. Now I have observations in multiple bands, and they're labeled in different colors. So this is a a workaround that uh, works very nicely, uh, but it's really something that is a temporary band-aid. We're gonna, uh, there is already a, a plan to have uh, uh, basically a, an ability for you to put the colors into uh, um, into into this particular set of observations, uh, into this particular plot. Okay, so what I'm going to do here in chart options, maybe uh, I can uh, even, uh, in trace options, maybe I can do something like rainbow. So this might be even better. And yeah. And this is probably better because the colors are farther apart from each other. So you can see now that uh, different bands are plotted in different colors. So I hope that that answers your question. But this is again 
described in more detail in uh, in uh, Portal Tutorial 05. It did. Thank you. Okay, great. So again, I showed you a sort of a, a bit of a dirty trick here, <laughs> but you know we are quite often we are required or we are we are driven to 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 use those if if there's no direct functionality of that kind. Okay, let me just take a look on chat if there's anything else. Okay, so Ryan answered the question uh, about the cadence of observations. He says, I believe the cadence of observations in the DP0 data comes from the early baseline survey strategy. So it really, again, this is entirely simulated data. So the idea here was to provide sufficient number of, uh, of pointings uh, for an area where there is a supernova for you to be able to actually to do this kind of uh, investigation that we just did. But you will hear more about some of the details and uh, I think Ryan is presenting later on today. Is that right, Ryan? Yep, that's right. Right. Okay, so if there are, are, if there are no other questions, maybe at this point I should stop sharing. And uh, I think that the next app will be Gloria. So I apologize for taking a bit more than I probably should, but uh, let me, okay, good. All right, Jeff, back to you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, so um, Gloria is going to continue on this theme uh, with more portal tutorial about um, looking at the, or yeah, looking at the host galaxy of a supernova. Okay, uh, and you can see my portal thing, right? Yep. Okay, uh, so I guess I'll also introduce myself. So I'm Gloria Fonseca Alvarez. I'm a postdoc with the community science team. Uh, and I will be talking uh, more about the, the supernova that we just uh, saw in the portal, in the last portal tutorial. Uh, so we're going to try to uh, identify some potential uh, host galaxies for that supernova uh, by looking at some images. Uh, so the way that you can access images uh, through the portal is through the image search ops tab. Oh, and I guess before that, uh, since you all just did a query, uh, you can uh, reset everything, I believe, by going to reset column selections and constraints. Um, and if that didn't work, you can just open uh, a new tab. Uh, but uh, you can access the ops tab for images uh, by just clicking this here under LSST DP0 DC2 tables. Um, and uh, most this is a very short tutorial and uh, most of the constraint will just be the default. Uh, but the, the first thing that you need to do is select a calibration level for the images. Uh, so you can access uh, raw data, the process visit, visit images and the coads. So for this tutorial, uh, we're gonna be using the deep coads. And for that, we need to select a calibration level three. Then uh, we want to look at that same supernova. So I'm gonna copy, I'm gonna paste the uh, coordinates in the chat again. And uh, you can just put those in here uh, under location, coordinates or object name. And then uh, the only other thing that we need to do is tell it what data product we want. And as I said, we wanted the deep coads. And I'm also going to paste that in the chat, but we just put it here in the data product subtype. Okay, uh, and then we can just click search. And now uh, this looks very similar to what we just saw in the other portal tutorial, uh, except now we have also an image. Uh, so in the in the query results, we have uh, images for uh, all six filters. Uh, we also have a default chart uh, that just shows the, you know, both the image and this are just showing the um, the top result. Uh, but we can get rid of this chart since we're not going to be using it. Uh, again, you can go to by view tables to only view the table and something else, but now uh, this has uh, another tab, which is the data products tab, uh, which is what we want. Um, but this is just uh, just showing uh, 
the coad and the Y filter. Uh, and uh, as a reminder, the deep coads are just uh, the stacked uh, process single visit images. Um, but we uh, probably want to look at all six filters. Uh, so to do that, uh, we can, where is that? I cannot find it. Okay, so I originally uh, did this step later on, so I'm going to go back. <laughs> uh, before getting rid of all three, uh, you can see this uh, this grid uh, that will allow you to look at all of the images uh, in the in the in the table. Uh, so click that first, <laughs> and uh, in a second, all of the images will be shown. Yeah, interestingly, I think that the Rubin Science platform is running a bit more slowly than it was yesterday. We, we did the same thing, and I think that Gloria is seeing the same, uh, same, same behavior as I did. I just finally got all six images. Okay, Yumi said that is a bug and reported. Do you mean that uh, that you can't do the grid thingy after? Yes. Okay. Yes, in the yeah. by view table mode, yes. Yeah. Is yours even still working? Is it still working? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, because you you got yours. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, <laughs> so now we have all six images and now I can, okay, uh, I can get rid of the table. Um, okay, so uh, you can, uh, one of the first things uh, that we can add is just a little compass. Uh, there's a little tool, so, uh, to, tool um, functionality. Uh, where uh, I'll just add the compass, but you can uh, do other things such as extract information from the image. Uh, but uh, so, yeah. So one of the things that you might be interested in doing is uh, making sure that anything that you do to any specific image uh, is done to the other images. So to do that, you can uh, go to this, uh, little lock uh, which will uh, which can align the images and uh, keep them all doing the same thing. Uh, so if you go to that, uh, you can align a lock uh, by WCS. And now anytime that you move uh, around an image, it will do the same in the other images. Um, but uh, so we want to go see uh, a potential galaxy for this supernova. So uh, once again, uh, you'll need the coordinates uh, that I put in the chat, but you can go to image center dropdown, which just looks like a little target. And uh, you can just put in the same coordinates and uh, go and mark. You'll see that now there is an extra, um, an extra little circle there and you can just zoom in uh, and you'll see that there's some uh, some extended objects near the location of the supernova. Okay. 
Um, but you can also uh, change the order of these images, uh, which you can uh, click on this em underscore min. I'm not going to do that just in case, uh, just in case that also takes time. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, and then uh, another thing that you might want to do is just change the scaling of the images. And uh, to do that, you just go to stretch drop down. And uh, there's already some prescribed uh, different uh, scalings, but if you go to color stretch, it will give you a little pop up window and uh, you can sp specify your limits. Uh, and we want to do a uh, log and uh, the default is to do it by uh, sigma, but we want uh, percent for this example. And uh, you can just change it to between one and 99.5. And uh, you also, if this UC scale for bounds is selected, you can unselect that, but the default is for it not to be uh, selected. Just wait a second. And uh, the point of that uh, was to maybe make it a little more obvious that uh, previously uh, this had a little more extension. And now uh, now that we changed the scaling, you can see that there's maybe another another object closer to the uh, to the actual location of the supernova. Uh, but actually figuring out uh, which galaxy the supernova belongs in is beyond the scope of this. This is just to show some very basic, uh, very basic uh, image access uh, capabilities from the portal. Um, but I think that's all that I had. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions about this. I have a quick question. Um, is it possible to uh, have the screens coordinate so that when you're zooming in or you're you're moving around on one image on that display, all of them respond accordingly, or do you have to always treat them individually? Uh, yeah. So that step was the to go to uh, this. I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> it's just the one next to the two arrows. Uh, but for that, there's like different uh, different alignment and locking options. Uh, so I guess you could do it also by whatever. Oh, I see it now. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, there's also, I guess in the, oh, okay. <laughs> oh. This does not typically happen. <laughs> Usually, there's not, I guess, these many people exactly at the same time looking at the same uh, thing. Um, but something that did not happen this time that happened before was that I kept having to uh, recenter the image, and uh, you can do that very easily. Uh, but I probably should add here <clears throat> that this portal aspect of the Rubin Science Platform is actually not something that has been developed from scratch, but it has actually been developed already some time ago by IPAC people. I don't remember exactly what the current name of, of, uh, of that is, but uh, it is actually very similar to some of the tools used for other data analysis uh, projects. Um, so, so if you're learning how to use the portal for Rubin data, you are learning actually how to, you're learning some functionality that would be applied for other missions as well. And maybe somebody else who is more familiar with this can can elaborate on this more. But this is, learning this is not just learning about Rubin, it's learning a, a, a tool that will be more versatile. Anything else? I have many questions for sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't see anything in Slack. Um, 
So, uh, all right. We're, yeah, we are giving the the science platform a little bit of a stress test right now with a lot of users simultaneously, but this is good. It also helps the science platform team uh, learn how things are performing. Uh, so thank you, Greg and Gloria. That was fantastic. Um, we are due for a break. So um, we'll, uh, I guess we were scheduled to take a break at the top of the hour for 10 minutes. So um, how about we'll, we'll make it a 12 minute break from now. So we'll go until five minutes past the hour, 9.05 my time. Um, so see you all back at five past the hour for uh, back to the notebook aspect um, demo of difference image analysis.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we can can resume now. Um, we will res resume with a um, another notebook tutorial from Ryan Lau. So you can go ahead and take it away, Ryan. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, hi everyone, uh, I'm Ryan Lau. Uh, I'm a staff astronomer at NORLAB and also a member of the community science team. Um, so in this session, uh, we're gonna go back to the notebook environments and uh, we're gonna look at a notebook 07A, which goes through uh, kind of an in-depth uh, look at what exactly the DIA object catalog provides and also how we can use it to identify um, type 1A supernovae. So it's kind of an example of a type of transient uh, that you can look at um, and look at the code and try to kind of get an idea of how you can use this um, for your own uh, transient science to build light curves and find things. Um, so since this is our first notebook tutorial uh, of the day, um, I figured I'd start back off here. So I'm assuming everyone can see this screen here where my mouse is moving. Um, and we'll go to the notebook environment, whereas earlier we were in this, the portal um, aspect. So you're just going to click on notebooks. And then uh, you're going to want to use a medium container if you have that thing pop up. Um, so let's see what we'll click here. And then um, we'll wait here for this to, to load up. Okay, and I'll go back to my home directory just to show you where the notebook is. So I have a bunch of other stuff here, but what you want to do is you want to go to notebooks and then uh, tutorial notebooks, which is right here. And um, we're going to look at 07A DIA object samples. So you're going to want to double click that uh, and open that up. Um, so I already have another window with this open. So I'm just going to switch back over to that. I just wanted to show everyone how to uh, access the notebook that we're going to use for this session. All right, so here it is. Um, let's see, I'm going to close or minimize the sidebar here so you can see this a little bit better. So hopefully uh, this is a good um, font size or the screen looks okay, but if not, uh, let me know and I can try to zoom in a bit more here. Um, all right, so this notebook um, was made by uh, Melissa Graham. And then I also, I've added some updates into this to include um, some other uh, object catalogs in here uh, to demonstrate the different kind of utilities of these different um, products from the DP 0.2 to study um, transients like these type 1A supernovae. So this is a pretty uh, lengthy notebook and I'm actually gonna skip over part of it because part of it goes into a really deep dive on like statistics and things that you can do uh, with the DIA object catalog. Um, so the, basically the purpose of this is to get a really good idea. This notebook is to get an idea of what this difference image analysis object table is. Um, and essentially these are just tables that are output um, that provide information on any source or I guess object that's identified in difference imaging analysis. Ryan? Um, yes. Um, sorry, I was asking if you could please zoom in a little bit more. Oh, sure. Uh, let me do Thank that. Um, all right, but what is the best way to zoom in here? I can do this. Okay. Did that help? <laughs> Just zoomed in a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, the, so the purpose of this difference imaging object, object catalog uh, is it provides you pretty much all of these different uh, flux measurements and parameters uh, and statistics uh, to study objects that are time variable in, in, the, in the sky. Um, through a uh, difference image uh, detection from the pipeline. Um, so we're going to look at uh, the difference image object catalog, uh, the DIA source table, so and also the four source on DIA object table. So these are the three things that you'll hear me mention um, a lot throughout this uh, throughout this notebook. Um, so the way to kind of think about these, and hopefully the, that will become clear as I go through this. Uh, a DIA object table is kind of a collection of DIA sources. So DIA sources are like the detection um, of a, a high signal to noise-ish greater than five source 
that gets identified in a difference image. So a reference, you have a reference template and your new kind of process visit image or CalExp. And then you see something that's changing uh, with greater than five sigma, that's a DIA source. And then um, the pipeline kind of does a source, has a source association algorithm that identifies with it with a particular DIA object. Um, so a DIA object is kind of a collection of DIA sources and also includes the uh, statistics of, of those sources. Uh, and then the fourth source on DA object is essentially um, a DA object table that runs the four source photometry at that location of that DA object. Okay, so uh, let me just go right into this uh, here. Um, so yeah, the, the purpose of this notebook is to look at this table uh, and to kind of get a better idea of how to how to use this with the explicit example of uh, retrieving light curves um, and how it might and how it can be yeah, directly applicable to looking for like low redshift type 1a supernovae that will have been identified in the DIA object table. Um, so just a I guess a, a, a disclaimer here, the notebook isn't going to produce like or the, the code in this notebook isn't producing like a pure or complete sample of this 1a supernovae, uh, just sort of one, uh, strategy or technique uh, that you can use to try to uh, identify them. And um, I'll get into that um, yeah, shortly. So it's kind of like, as I mentioned here, it's like a demonstration and starting point for a more rigorous classification process. Um, but the nice thing is you can kind of use this uh, to get an idea of how you might try to apply this code to your own um, transients uh, of, of interest. Okay. And so again, yeah, here's the, the definition of these different catalogs. And I'll be talking about these a lot throughout this uh, throughout this notebook. And of course, if you want to learn more about these tables, you can just click this uh, link here about the DP 0.2 uh, documentation. All right, uh, one more thing that I wanna mention before I get into this. Um, so, and this is like a, a, a point about kind of the limitations of the DP 0.2 data set, which is produced by uh, the Dark Energy Science Collaboration for their data challenge too. Um, since this, this was created as kind of a dark energy focused uh, simulated data set, uh, the only types of transients that are in the simulated data are type 1a supernovae. Um, so there's no type 2 supernovae or any other types of kind of exotic uh, transients. Um, but uh, that's okay because it lets you, um, with, with the type 1a supernovae, uh, it kind of lets you test things out uh, to try to see how, uh, how it works to, to find these types of sources. Um, there's also uh, variable stars, uh, different classes of variable stars like R, Lyrae's, um, and that will be uh, discussed in notebook 07B, which will be either today or today in the evening session and tomorrow. Um, I think we'll go through the 07B notebooks that do uh, variable star like curves and that kind of uh, analysis. All right, so before I get started here, um, I'm wondering if there's any questions or anything about anything I just mentioned or, or, or um, described like specifically on difference imaging analysis, the source table, the object and four source and DA objects. All right, if not, let's just get right into it. Okay, so we'll start off with some package imports as, uh, yep, as one does in uh, the notebooks. So we're gonna use, uh, yeah, NumPy, Matplotlib, um, this cosmology package. Uh, and all this is, is it's gonna convert uh, redshifts to distance or to distance moduli. So we can tell how bright we expect our supernovae to be given a certain redshift range. Uh, and then we're using a sigma clip statistics to do a kind of statistical analysis on the light curve um, photometry. And then uh, we're gonna use the we're going to be heavily using uh, the TAP search uh, that we've seen um, throughout this uh, summer school uh, to search and, uh, and grab these um, these objects or these these uh, supernova candidates. So uh, I guess we'll enter that here, and then um, we'll start up the TAP service using this command, and then set the cosmology uh, package here. So this again, this will just give us. Um, the distance moduli based on um, the redshift that we that we input here. So that's all all this thing is doing. And then uh, a few parameters to make our tables or our, our uh, plots look nice. 
Okay, so this section two is what I mentioned uh, earlier, that this really does a, a deep dive onto uh, understanding the statistics of quantities that are provided in the DA object table. Um, but I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this entire section two. Um, this might be something that we can go through in a, a, a breakout session um, for those who are interested uh, in these in these properties. Um, but I figure we can just dive right into the um, supernova uh, part of it and looking at the light curves and how we find them. Uh, I, I can just give a quick uh, description here of what of um, what statistics and properties that you can have from the DIA source and object table. So uh, since that'll be useful for um, useful knowledge to have uh, as we go into the supernova stuff. So um, like these are some of the uh, products that are provided in the DIA object table. Um, you can also look at the uh, data preview 0.2 schema page to, to get an idea of, of what other um, properties they have. But just as an example, there's uh, like PS, uh, PS flux minimum. So the faintest flux of the source in, in that object table, the maximum flux, the average standard deviation. Um, so things like that. And then if you want more information on this, there's the as I mentioned uh, just briefly or a little while ago, um, there's this schema page that goes through what every single entry is uh, that you have in this DIA object table. Um, so I can provide a link to that in the chat here. And I think it's also been brought up uh, previous days in the in this summer school. Um, but you can look here. There's This is the table that we'll be using, or one of the tables we'll be using um, and so there's all of these different uh, properties here and the description of them here on the right uh, for each filter, like here's the G-band filter, I-bands. So all six filters, it'll have all of these different properties here. Um, so you can do lots of stuff with it and look at um, lots of different, um, do lots of different statistical analyses on uh, the fluxes and different colors uh, as well. Um, and again, the way to think about this DA object table, the way or the way that I like to think of it is that each astrophysical object will have like a DIA object associated it, with it. So like um, in like the portal tutorials earlier today, uh, I think Greg searched for a particular DIA object ID um, that we knew was associated with a type 1a supernova. And so all of the properties, the flux is and everything associated with that supernova can be provided with this DIA object table, which has a DIA object ID that's linked to that um, particular source. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip over uh, section two uh, again. If people are if people are interested in some of these uh, statistical plots here for the DA objects, we can go through that in a breakout session. Um, but I wanted to jump just directly to section three, um, where how we can identify. Uh, DIA objects that are potential type 1a supernovae. Um, so the thing I, th I think to keep in mind here is how you can potentially use this for, for finding um, your own transients that, that you're interested in. So type 2 supernovae or things that um, uh, might have or, or properties of uh, like light curve properties of the transients you're interested in finding and how you might adapt that into this, um, this, this uh, the RSP environment to try to uh, find these um, and uh, extract their light curves. So uh, what we're going to do is get a sample of potential uh, low redshift well sample type 1a supernovae uh, that are simulated in this uh, DP0.2 data set. Um, the thing about uh, type 1a supernovae that makes this really nice to use is that they have really nice homogeneous light curves that peak at a very similar absolute brightness, so about minus 19 magnitudes in B-band. And that's really helpful here for trying to, um, to identify them because we can set, um, we have an expectation of how bright we expect them to be. And also uh, we have an idea of how long we expect to detect them. So we know the duration, we know the amplitude and, and the brightness. And then we can use those parameters um, to search through the DIA object table to identify um, certain DIA objects that have those properties. Um, so, uh, yep, so we're, we're going to use the, the R band um, to, to find these. And also, we'll set some constraints with some of the other filters. 
Uh, but we, we're trying to look at things that are brighter than about 24.5 uh, magnitudes here and look for supernovae that are between uh, redshifts 0.1 and sort of 0.3. And this figure kind of shows the, the range of the light curves that we expect to see for these types of supernovae. Uh, this green one here being at a redshift of 0 0.1 and this orange one here at a redshift of 0 0.3. So these are the ones that are yeah, further away. Uh, and then so we have an idea now of what amplitudes we might expect to see uh, based on a, a 24.5 mag cutoff and also a duration where we'd be able to detect that um, or that, that um, LSSC or Rubin would be able to detect that. And then, yeah, another another warning here that this is kind of a rough way to try to identify these um, and that there are, are definitely more rigorous uh, routines to classify um, type 1a supernovae, um, which might be an interesting idea to try to apply to this data set um, and to see how it kind of compares with this, uh, this rough way to um, find these candidates. All right, um, I can pause a little bit here if there's any questions about what we're doing or um, about the DI object uh, table or, or anything here. Um, so any questions? All right, so let's get right into this here. Um, so what we're doing now is we're gonna establish the parameters that constrain um, these potential 1A supernovae. Uh, so first, we're just setting our redshift range from minus one to 0.3. So pretty much in this subsection, we're gonna do exactly like we described here um, in this. So we're gonna look for supernovae that look like, uh, that have light curves uh, like, like this bright or this faint. So we're setting the redshift minimum and max, 0 0.1, 0 0.3. Um, the 1A peak magnitude to be 19, minus 19. And then we'll give it some flexibility of about 0.5 uh, to it, uh, on, the, on the peak magnitude range, so 0.5 magnitudes here. So we're going to execute this cell. And then uh, it's using this AstroPy cosmology package, again, to convert redshift to distance modulus. So that's what's going on here, uh, where it's getting the peak minimum peak and the maximum peak based on the redshift values that we input, the peak magnitude that we uh, input, and also this kind of range here, this minus um, supernova peak mag range. So kind of like a, a some, some wiggle room there. So I'll execute that cell. Uh, and then, yeah, so this tells us here, like, all right, this is what the uh, minimum uh, and maximum apparent R magnitudes that we're gonna use in our tap search. So about, 19 mags to about 22.5 magnitudes. All right, and then just to have some other constraints on our, our supernova candidates, um, that's gonna be output from our tap search. Uh, we'll set maximum uh, peak magnitudes here for uh, our other, other filters. So the G band and, R and I band filters. So we're using the R band, uh, but we can use these other filters um, to enforce that there's at least uh, detections in these uh, in these filters as well. Uh, we don't use any color information, but if you wanted to do that, you can probably apply stronger constraints. Um, but this is just making sure there's some detections here. And then uh, here we're just defining the um, minimum and maximum amplitudes that you would expect to detect for um, these. Uh, for, for the supernovae that we want to identify. Oh, I just realized I didn't execute this. So I'll, yep, make sure we do that. And um, so the minimum amplitude uh, that we're going to expect in R band is 1.5. And the maximum we can expect is about 5.5. And so these numbers, we'll, we'll execute this, are based on essentially this plot here. Because if our limiting detection is about 24.5 magnitudes, you can see that the amplitude that we would expect for this, the most distant supernova would be about 1.5. And then the amplitude we would expect for this nearby one is about 5.5, um, which helps set the range of uh, supernovae uh, that we want, to, uh, we want to identify. So that's where these numbers are coming from. And it, it kind of describes that here um, as well. Okay, and then we also uh, want to um, make sure that our light curve is well sampled. 
Um, so we can set the total number of, or the minimum number of DIA sources, which is kind of the, the minimum number of detections of that supernova or supernova candidate. And we set that to 15, um, somewhat arbitrary, but we want it to be fairly well sampled. So 15 is a good number there. Uh, and we set a maximum here of 100. And so this is an interesting number. So uh, why do we even set an upper limit? Um, and the reason for that is because we don't expect there to be uh, more than 100 visits per field uh, per year. And so we don't expect the supernova to last any longer than a year. So there shouldn't be over 100 uh, detections uh, of, the, of a supernova, a type 1a supernova. Um, over a year. So if that happens and something is wrong, it's not, it's likely not uh, a supernova or it could be a variable. So that's where that maximum um, uh, constraint comes from. Um, so we'll execute that. And then uh, set a minimum duration here of 50 days to 300 days. Again, that's kind of based on the, the template. Uh, so this is about 50 days minimum, maybe, and then this is about 300-ish uh, or 250. Um, so that's where those uh, these constraints are coming from. So again, just think this is was coming up with certain um, ways to constrain your search in DIA objects um, that will will produce things that look like the supernovae that we want to find uh, using duration, the number of detections you have of that supernova, and uh, the the amplitude of the supernova, as well as uh, the peak brightness and uh, detections in other bands. So a, a pretty it, a pretty decent way to, um, but but kind of rough way to identify things that look like one A supernovae. All right, so we're going to jump into this section here, three point two, and uh, we're going to retrieve uh, the sample. So we'll use all those constraints that we set, and run it through uh, a tap query um, to identify uh, all of the uh, DIA objects that. Um, that that seem to match our our, um, our constraints. So that's what this is doing here. Uh, you'll note that we use this yeah this function here, um, converting from Nanojanskis to ABMag, because the output in the DA object table of the fluxes are in Nanojanskis. And so um, since I, I think some people prefer ABMag, some people prefer, prefer Janskis. Um, but I think maybe most people who study supernovae are more familiar with um, using magnitudes. So uh, we'll convert to AB magnitudes um, using this function here. And in this tap search, we're actually only, only going to look at the top uh, thousand that come out from this search because there's probably you know, a ton of objects that would come with this and it would take forever to run this search if we didn't uh, limit this. And uh, this is just showing the different properties that we're going to be searching. So RA deck. DA object ID, number of DIA sources, R mag max, so the maximum R magnitude, uh, or yeah, these these values here. So these are the um, values that we're qu querying from the DIA object table. Um, so you can see like here, like RPSF min, these are all values that uh, are, are provided from this table about these objects. And so that's exactly what we're querying here in this tap search, um, the constraints on the DIA sources, uh, and then um, the constraints on the maximum and uh, minimum fluxes that we set. So th those are all of these things that we have here. And then uh, we're defining uh, the RMAG amplitude outside of the tap search because it's. I think this runs faster if you do math outside of the of the search. Um, so after the search is done, it gets saved to this DA object table. And uh, actually, we should execute this because it might take a minute to run. Um, so, oh, wow, that was super quick. Okay, never mind. So, uh, we have this uh, RMAG amplitude that we'll define here um, based on the RMAG min and RMAG max. So, it's just subtracting those two things. And then, yeah, deleting the, the results so we can kind of uh, save space. And then, uh, if we wanted to, we can uh, uncomment this line and then look at the contents of this table. Um, so you'll see the table length is a thousand. There's probably a lot more than these that fit our criteria that we specified, and it has all of the things that we that we wanted uh, here for the table to provide. So the number of DIA sources. So that's essentially how many detections um, are in this 
made of the of this these candidate supernovae, and then um, these values here that we that we set. Um, so all of these should fall within the constraints that we we uh, specified in the previous subsection. Okay. Um, so I can pause a little bit here for for questions, or if there's anything that um, anyone would like me to clarify on uh, these these steps. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, a histogram um, of the brightest magnitude and the, the light curve amplitudes here. Um, so we're just going to execute this here just to look at, um, just as a way to view what our sample of stuff uh, looks like. Um, oh, let's see. I see that I have a question from uh, Priscilla. So why is the length? A thousand that we constrained it to a hundred visits. Yes. Okay. So there's there's um, so the table length. This is the number of DIA objects that I want this search to return. So that's that's constraining the number of candidates uh, I'm asking this query to provide. So that's separate from the number of uh, visits that we have in our or, or detections that we have in our light curve. So uh, you're right that we set the maximum number of um, detections or NDIA sources, that's this here, to 100. Uh, but we specified the table length, um, the maximum number of DIA objects to provide, so the number of candidates to be um, 1,000. So if I wanted to, I can change this to like 500 if I, if I wanted less, uh, so something like this. And then I have, now I have a shorter table length um, so now this is only providing me the first 500 candidates that this search provides instead of the first thousand. So I'm going to switch this back to a thousand. So we're all consistent here. Um, so yeah, I hope that addresses that that question. Okay. Yep, and then I can pause a little bit more for if there's any any other questions here. Okay, so let's plot this histogram here, uh, just to get an idea of what our sample looks like. Okay, so um, so the one thing that I may have messed up in this notebook is that the magnitudes are being plotted in negative values. So it I, I probably should have in, included like a um, like an absolute value here that might have uh, been more helpful in interpreting amplitude, but it's plotted in negative ways or in, in yeah, negative is, is higher amplitude. Um, so apologies. Uh, so just a couple of interesting things here. So there's a lot of uh, bright things here. There's, there's kind of a bimodal uh, distribution, um, which seems a little strange. Um, there's also like a tail here. So you have things that are faint, uh, a lot of things that are faint, which you might expect um, because uh, as you kind of go out to further distances, you're sampling a larger volume. So you might expect the number of things that are fainter to be um, more frequent. Uh, but then there's kind of a, a shift in this. There's, there's like a, a kind of discontinuity in the slope here where you see more stuff that have brighter amplitudes uh, or relative to the, the slope here. And likely it's coming from other time variable sources uh, in, in, uh, in the, the simulated data set. So that's kind of the what what could be going on here in the histogram. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to use this to uh, see what your search is providing. So maybe plotting some histogram of, of some properties is a good way to uh, vet your your search and and try to identify how well it's working and if there's any kind of contaminants uh, in your candidate search. Okay. Um, so this next section, uh, we're going to calculate the duration. Um, of these supernovae, so we can set our duration uh, constraint. Um, what we're going to do here is uh, we're just going to def like define like a uh, set this duration column here in our DA object table. And just as a reminder, this is our DA object table here. So our list of a thousand um, uh, 1A candidates. And we're going to create another column there called duration. 
And um, to get that value, uh, we're going to run another uh, tap search. So let's execute this since this might take four minutes. So probably a little bit shorter than that. So we'll execute this cell. Um, and what it's doing is it's searching based on the DIA object IDs in the DIA object table. So it's going to take our thousand DIA objects, um, search for those particular DIA object IDs, and then grab this midpoint TAI, uh, which corresponds to the timing of, of those observations. Um, so it's going to get the timing of all of the observations uh, that were taken uh, in the in the DA object table and, and search through the DA source table to grab those those numbers. So it's it's okay. So let's take a step back. It's going to take look search through each of these DA objects, look through all of the DIA sources associated with that DIA object, and then grab the time uh, of each of those um, DIA sources. So every single point in that light curve associated with the, that DIA object, um, it's going to uh, grab those, those the time of those observations. So that's what this midpoint TAI is here. Uh, and then um, it's with the table, we're going to save the results to results. And then now we're going to define duration as the maximum uh, um, time that, uh, or or the yeah the, the maximum time in in MJD and then the uh, minimum time in in MJD. So if you subtract those, that should give you um, the the approximate duration of that um, of that supernova candidate. So for example, what that is is it's you're essentially, if, you're, if this is our light curve is, and these are all the detections, it's essentially taking this value, 250 um, minus this value here, which would be negative, but um, yeah, kind of see what I mean here. So that's that's what that um, search is providing there. Right, and then, yeah, I guess for yeah, additional descriptions of what exactly this is, I think, yeah, we also, um, saw Greg mention this property in the portal tutorial earlier. Uh, it's just, uh, I guess, yeah, certain SI units of um, yeah of, of time and presented in um, modified Julian days. So that's what's going to be output here. So it's in units of uh, days. Yep. And then since the search is taking a little bit, I think it's been about three minutes so far. So we'll see if it finishes up in the next minute or so. Um, I can pause here and take uh, any questions. Yeah, and then just to remind people of what we're doing here. So the whole point of doing this part um, this tap search is so we can get um, so we can get uh, this duration parameter. So so we can place a constraint on the duration of the um, detections of the of these DA object candidates. So to provide another constraint on that. And what's interesting though is that you don't have that's so the DA object table doesn't provide duration or um, Really, any indication of of the time period of when those uh, of when that source is detected. Um, otherwise, we could have done that in this search here, looking because we searched through the DA object table. Um, so there's not. I don't think there's any time uh, parameters in the DA object table. Otherwise, we could have done that in this search here without having to run through this search um, and ever looking at every single DA object ID in. Um, in the in the DIA source table um, to get those time measurements. Um, that might change later. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but that's that's why we're doing another search here to do the constraint on the on the duration. Yep. Okay. And then I see a couple of questions here. Um, one by Robert Hines. If we expect future data previews with the richer selection of astrophysical object types, and I think Greg, um, yeah, answered that question. So DP 0 0.3, um, I think is, is going to come out pretty soon. Uh, but that one focuses on solar system objects. Um, so I don't think there'll be 
any other types of transients, uh, like type two supernovae or uh, I don't know, luminous blue variable outbursts or other types of um, uh, different types of transients, um, especially since I think we'll have uh, Ruben coming online pretty soon. I think we can start getting, getting ready to expect to see the real thing. Uh, and then Bob is asking, uh, could much of this be done in the portal as well? Uh, that's a good question. I think so, because all we're doing is running uh, a tap search. So um, you can presumably do these, like this tap search. Yeah, I think so. So you can do this tap search in the portal. Um, and then it'll output all of those. Yeah, I'll put, I'll put all those candidates. So that is, that might, yeah, that might be an interesting way to um, kind of play around with with the, the statistics or your sample. And that's a little more interactive. So that could be, that might actually be a good way to do your initial search. Uh, and then once you narrow it down, you can then work in your notebook uh, environment to, um, yeah, to do that. Okay, so if this takes, uh, we'll wait like another um, minute for this to finish. And if not, I already ran it in another notebook. So we'll just pop that open. Um, and then, uh, yeah, other people might, has, has this has this cell finished for anyone else or is it still running? Mine is still running. Okay, yeah, we'll give it another like, min or 30 seconds and then if not i'm i'm going to switch over to a notebook where i have uh, all of this executed already okay yeah oh okay so george said that it finished for him so so once i have more than 7 minutes okay so yeah this might take a uh, take a little bit let's see and there's a question about um let's see if people are allowed to join dp03 uh jeff answered that so the answer is yes um, you'll have ads, uh, access to 0 0.3. No additional signups or anything will be needed. And I think there'll be um, a lot of information uh, once when all of that um, is is made uh, is released and made public. Um, question from Matt Weisner. Uh, when real Ruben data comes available, will it appear as new tables alongside existing DC2 tables in the RSP? Uh, I Yeah, I... Uh, I Actually, I don't know what happens to the, the DC2 tables in the RSP. I'm, I'm assuming that would just go away when, when the real data come out. Um, but maybe it might be there as a as a um as an interesting, as a good resource. Uh, or it might be, I don't know if that's that's confusing. I'm not sure what's what's gonna happen with that. My suspicion is that there probably will be new additional tables because of the fact that we'll be learning from the data. So far, simulated data is on the basis of what we know from the past, but you know. The discovery is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Thanks, Greg. All right. Um, so this is taking a while. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. So George mentioned that uh, they started running this earlier, and then so it might have. Yeah. Might, maybe it'll take a a little bit longer for this to run. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to um, another. Let's see. Tab here where I have this. Um, have this opened. Um, what, what do I want to do? I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. Sorry, and I'm going to switch over to a tab where I have this already executed. And um, apologies for those who are following along. Uh, this might make it a little more difficult, um, but we'll switch back over to uh, the more interactive stuff um, when uh, um, when we run, go encounter a search where we don't, which shouldn't take too much time. So yeah, I guess if you want to, or if people want to, they can just try to execute, uh, or after this is done, try to execute everything else, and then uh, we'll uh, run through that. Okay, so what we should get uh, is we would run through this. So this is the duration here, and you can see I ran this uh, yesterday to make sure that um, I have this loaded up. Um, and then what this cell here following that is uh, it's restricting the duration to the minimum and maximum durations that we set, and then providing the number um, of uh, candidate or objects that fall into that range. And so interestingly, there's only 43. So we've narrowed it down quite a bit from that initial thousand that we have. 
So a lot of those seem to have much longer durations than, um, so, so this seems to be the really constraining criteria or one of the really constraining criteria for this, um, for this search. Oh, and then let me, I can, uh, let me just double check to see if it's finished. No, okay, yeah, I'll just run through this until the next section. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. And um, then what we can do is we can now plot a histogram of the light curve durations, um, kind of like we did before to look at a histogram of our sample and uh, look for, uh, look at the scatter plots and also the um, light curve duration here, uh, which kind of gives us an idea of what our sample looks like. And if we have an idea of how we expect the trends in the amplitude and light curve duration to match. Um, so this, yeah, this kind of seems like uh, what, what we might expect that um, uh, we might expect that the things that have longer light curves are brighter, so have higher amplitudes. Um, again, since I define amplitude in kind of a weird negative way, uh, the negative ones in indicate higher amplitudes. So this stuff looks consistent with what we want to see for 1A supernovae, but there's a couple of outliers here, like this one, this one, and this one, and that's could be some of these uh, these things here. So there's a couple stuff that might have that look a little strange, and I think yeah, to to uh, I think Bob's comment about the portal using this in the portal, this might be a good way to the portal might be a nice interactive way to like you, know, you click on these things here, and then it'll tell you a little bit more about those. Um, those properties and what uh, um, what they correspond to. So that would actually be an interesting way to um, uh, to look at your your sample here. My query finished, Ryan. Too. I just want to let you know. Oh, okay. Uh, Ten minutes. Okay, that's the yeah, factor of over factor two longer than, than I would have expected. Um, oh, nice. Okay, yeah, it's done. So hopefully this is finished uh, for everyone else. Uh, well, sw I'll switch back to this one so we can go through this here. Go 42. Oh, wait, that's interesting. Was this other one 42? No, oh, this is 43. So there's something different that happened between this and this. That's weird. All right, well, let's, we'll just roll with it. Okay, so here's that same uh, table here that I, uh, that I showed, or the same plots that I showed. And um, now we're going to plot. Uh, the multiband light curves of of these things here. Forty two. Okay, I don't I don't know why there's why some are forty two and some are forty three. Uh, that's strange. Um, I I wonder if that has something to do with how much stress we're putting on the RSP, but that that shouldn't happen. It should all be the same, assuming that. It, it could be because I messed up, I messed around with this, um, that I was selecting the top thousand, then top 500, then top thousand. So yeah. That's... Or did, because my table didn't look like your table. So maybe I just had a different data set than you did when you searched, maybe? I think it always brings up the same. Because I, I had a different, um, when you did the first. Yeah. So here's what my data objects table looks like. Yeah, mine doesn't look like that. Mine looks different. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't realize there's some slight variations. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, ultimately this is not going to um, affect the, the the outcome of the notebook, but that's interesting. It, I don't think it's like a random thousand. Oh, wait, maybe it's well, hold on, maybe it's the same. Hold on. Nope, mine's different. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just, uh, we'll go through that. Some people's light curves might look a little bit different. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Well, I got 42, um, which is a, yeah, that's a pretty cool number. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll look at uh, section 3.4. Let's plot multiband light curves for the first 20. And so now I kind of wonder if this is going to look different for everyone, but everyone should have at least 20. Um, so let's plot these light curves. That's all this um, this cell is doing is grabbing those um, uh, the AB magnitudes from the DIA source catalog. And yeah, I'm not sure how long this is going to take. It shouldn't take too long. There we go. Yep. All right. And then so 
This is our uh, sample of light curves in all the different filters. Um, yeah, I guess we don't have a legend here on what each of these symbols corresponds to, but there's kind of a, in the beginning part of the notebook, we defined what symbols correspond to what uh, filters. Um, but here's our uh, 20 of our um, candidates. And it looks like a lot of them seem pretty 1A looking. Uh, they have like a peak here and they start to uh, decline over um, on some, sometime on the order of 50 to 100-ish days. So that's yeah, pretty pretty successful, um, I would say. I, yeah, I'm wondering if this, this looks different for some people though, or these, these light curves don't, um, maybe it's different depending on, on um, yeah, the, the search for some weird reason. Okay, cool. Um, so before I go into this force photometry light curve section, I'll pause and take any any questions here. Okay, yeah, people's light curves look different. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's yeah, yeah, interesting. I wonder why that is. Could be a, could be a different order of things, as Priscilla mentioned. Uh, do you think that this difference in how many how many uh, light curves that we get uh, could be potentially an issue when the real data is there? I don't think so. Um, I guess if we, it depends, yeah, okay, it depends on how you're doing a search. Like if you want to provide like a consistent sample, if you have like a notebook and you want all the results to be the same, um, then that might be an issue. Uh, I guess what we would really want to know is what is causing that, this, this issue. Like if this is just a random thousand objects, and then I might understand that there'd be some variation. Um, uh, and then, but you know, if our if our sample size is large enough, then um, your results will still be like pretty statistically significant. Like if we're trying to characterize how many uh, of these candidates are supernovae, then this it, it should still work. Or we might we might just want to search like all of the objects that are uh, that that are available, which would take much longer. But if we're doing a search for all through all DIA objects for type one A supernovae, then the order shouldn't matter because you're just grabbing all of them. Uh, that's that's what I would think. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about how this might affect um, the real data if we, because we want, you know, this, it would be nice if it was consistent, but maybe there's something I'm missing about how this search is done. Uh, and then, yeah, Yumi, I think, yeah, you, you have a, or, or Jeff mentioned that the search results are not necessarily returned in the same order. So that probably is um, what it's doing. And then uh, Yumi, I guess you have a comment here on this. Oh, yeah, same, it's a... same thing, yes. I think um, for the same number of um, row limits, it will return random subsets. So it doesn't necessarily return all the same uh, entries. Okay, that's good to know. So that is likely what's causing this this slight discrepancy in the number of sources. Yeah, in Portal, you also when you when you request a certain number, fixed number, limited number of sources, quite often you get different maps because different regions of the sky get there. Get. Yep, it's a bit random. So I think that's what you're seeing here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for. Helping diagnose what's what's going on there. That's um, yeah, brings me a little more comfort on this. Okay, so in the last uh, five minutes of this, um, I just wanted to go through this last section here, which is on uh, force photometry light curves. So what we're doing previously is we were only looking at the DIA object uh, catalog. So this is all these are all objects that have a greater than five signal to noise ratio detections on the difference images. Um, but so that, that works really well if you want to identify um, things that are changing in time, like transients. Um, but what's the next kind of logical step in, in kind of a, a scientific analysis of, of these candidates that you brought up? Um, one of the steps that you might want to do is to run force photometry on those sources to see if there's any uh, precursor activity or if there's anything else that's happening after that DA object peak. 
And that's exactly what we can do using the force source um, or force photometry light -like curve. So instead of just looking at only the detections with greater than five signal to noise, um, we're looking at a table that's just looking at all of the visit images and doing a force photometry at the location of that DAA object. Um, so you can find more information about that here. We're gonna look at a particular DAA object ID, um, this one, which has an interesting looking light curve um, that we know is, uh, is in our, our um, is uh, a type 1A supernova. So we'll just define this here. And then um, we're going to run a tap search through the force source on DIA object table, um, that's FSODO. So th you'll see that's uh, shortened here to that in our tap search. Uh, and uh, we're, we're gonna look, we're gonna bring out all of these values here. So the difference flux and the total flux and the uncertainties, the visit IDs. And um, that's what this uh, search here is doing. So this should be pretty quick because we're just looking at one object and yeah, it's done. And then we'll save it, uh, call these results as force source. Uh, so our table, um, yep, we'll have a force source table here. And we can check out, oh, actually, what we're going to do before that is um, we're going to retrieve the DIA source measurements uh, here. Um, we'll call this the DIA source table because we're going to look at the difference between the DIA source measurements and the force source uh, photometry of this particular supernova. And then this step here, all we're doing is just um, defining a difference signal to noise ratio, um, since it doesn't quite have that in the force source on DA object table. And then uh, if we want to take a look at what the force source table looks like, uh, here, here it is. So as a reminder, what we're looking at, uh, this, this is all of the force source photometry on every single visit at the particular location of our DA object. So the supernova that we specified, this is a four source um, photometry measurement at the RA index of that, um, of that supernova. So you can see all the RA index are the same, all the DA objects are the same, but the different CCT visit IDs corresponding to each kind of processed visit image. And then here's the, um, all the, the light curve information here on the, on the right. And let's just plot the light curve. So we're just setting these minimum and maximum values here and uh, plot the light curve here. Okay, so this really shows what the difference is between force source on DA object and the DIA source tables. Um, so this was the duration of our supernova based on the DIA source table. Um, this is These are the tech detections of that supernova at a signal to noise greater than five. And this is the force source photometry that shows all of the measurements in the entire span of the DP0 um, data set time uh, that show that there's no significant greater than five signal to noise detection of this supernova. Um, so this is all just kind of noise probably from uh, seeing or other, other things. So that's the, this is just, just showing the difference between these two tables and the utility of the force uh, source on DA object table in case you wanted to look for some kind of precursor activity. Um, so we can just execute these here. And this is just showing a zoom in of this table. So even in the duration, you can see that there's some wideband measurements that don't quite pass through the signal to noise greater than five threshold. So there's some stuff here that are likely yeah, way noisier, um, but that's not that doesn't make it through the, the pipeline um, to be classified as a DIA source, but they're here in the four source on DA object because there's no signal to noise cutoff in that, in that table. Um, so we could also play around here to try to identify the missing measurements. Um, so like that's what this cell is doing in 4.3. And then there's 27 measurements uh, here in the DIA source and then 40 here in the four source on DIA object. And uh, yeah, we can also find the unique visit IDs by looking at, at this too. Um, I'm gonna just go through this real quick. Uh, these are the unique 13 detections here. And then you'll see that the signal to noise of these is great, is less than five. So this kind of just confirms that we're looking at stuff that would not make it through uh, the DIA source detection. 
Um, and then the yeah, very last thing in the last uh, minute uh, is would be if we wanted to use this to look for any precursor outbursts. Um, so we can use at the Z band filter. Uh, I'm just going to execute these here. Uh, just go to the, we'll just look at the um, light curve. And then what we did, what essentially we did in this subsection is to identify that there is, there looks like maybe this is some precursor activity that's greater than the kind of standard deviation of uh, the Z band distribution of Z band measurements. Um, but we can do this to see if there's any kind of interesting um, outbursts other than the, the supernova explosion, which is something that we would want to do if we're looking for at uh, real transients. Um, like if there's a, a type two super or two N supernova that maybe there would be some interesting progenitor um, outbursts before the explosion. And we could use this technique or this code uh, to find that using the force source on, on DA object. Um, so just a yeah, good tools to have to um, identify and uh, uh, investigate the transients that you're interested in. Okay, uh, since I'm running yeah, a little bit over time, um, I can stop here and I'll be happy to to take any any questions on on this um, yep on this notebook. All right, and then I see a question from Priscilla. Why Z band? Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's redder, and it it was kind of like a priori. I I knew that there's some something kind of interesting here. Or it looked like a, a flare, um, based on this light curve. So it was mainly for uh, demonstrative purposes in the notebook. It's like, oh yeah, this looks like it could be interesting. So I just focused on the Z band filter. But you can choose any um, any of these to look at, like. Uh, based on the on the light curve, like I could have looked at the Y band filter too. Um, yeah, this is this is what I was thinking. Is like uh, in the C band and the Y band is uh, not uh, really a lot of difference. So. Yep. Yeah. So I only only chose the Z band since there's only there's one point that stands out from the rest, just visually looking at it. But you could, yeah, you could do any of the the filters. Thank you. Yep. Let me just add one comment here that an analogous. Uh, search can be done of, of this force source on a DIA object can be done using the portal. And in fact, if you want to take a look on how it's done in the portal, it's done, of course, much simpler version of this is done in the uh, um, tutorial node, uh, portal tutorial 05. So you can take a look on, on, on that if you wish. Yep. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, the, we, we had a good question from Bob about that earlier. And I think, yeah, it, that's, that's an interesting. Um, I think that would be a, like almost an I think an ideal approach, right? Like to do this in a more interactive way in the in the portal, um, and then maybe doing more of the heavy analysis to create plots and things. Um, like like here, we can. It's easier to. I think there was a question earlier about creating plots with different um, uh, plot markers and legends and things like that, and that's easier to do for now uh, in the notebook environment. Um, so yeah, you can utilize both of those. Uh, RSP aspects to do your analysis. You can use one more than the other um, if you want to. Um, I think yeah, it, it comes down to what's your your preferences. Um, but yeah, using the portal to do more of the interactive stuff um, is a good way to sift through the the candidates that you have. Um, so yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, so yeah, Jerry's calculation is taking longer than. 28 minutes. So <laughs> sorry that the, yeah, the R, the RSP seems to be a little bit uh, slower now, but I'm, yeah, I'm glad that, that um, we're able to, to get, get through this and that the calculation or that that didn't take maybe not too long for, for everyone, but yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what dictates the, the timing on that. Um, okay. All right. I'm going to stop here and then I'll hand the floor back to, uh, to Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, well, yeah, I guess again, today, part of the theme of today is apparently we're stress testing all of the science platform systems. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, and we are we're due for a break now. So I guess we can um to make sure we leave some time for breakouts. Uh, uh how about we we shorten our break 
to a five minute break and come back at 10 after the hour. And then uh, as we've been doing each day, um, come back with uh, ideas for explorations you might like to do in a breakout room. So we'll see you back in just a few minutes. <laughs>